Good morning, everyone. As Dr. Pritchett said, I am a senior here at CSU, majoring in soil and crop sciences. It's great to see all of you here this morning. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to the moderator of our first panel session, What's Next in the Agriculture, Agriculture Supply Chain? Dr. Alan S. Rudolph serves as the Vice President for Research at Colorado State University. Dr. Rudolph has had an active career in translating interdisciplinary life sciences into useful applications for biotechnology development. His experience spans basic research to advanced development in academia, government laboratories, and most recently in the nonprofit and private sectors. Welcome, Dr. Rudolph. Thank you very much. Uh, what an honor it is to open up the first panel uh, of this Ag Innovation Summit. First of all, I'd like to just uh, congratulate James. You're doing a great job, and I, I would vote for more cowbell as the hashtag uh, for, uh, for putting out there. But no, it's, it's really exciting to have this opportunity to share with you uh, our panel conversation. And you know, we took some time to think about this panel in the following way. Uh, innovation uh, grabs us in so many different ways, and in the ag sector, um, there are three particular vectors we wanted to explore in this panel, and we found some really outstanding people to represent them. And so uh, what I'd like to do is introduce briefly each of them, and as I introduce them, they can walk up and take a seat on the stage, and I'll start out with Howard Yana Shapiro. Howard is the Chief Agri Agricultural Officer at Mars uh, Corporation, a multinational, now nearly a $40 billion company. You've probably been watching them in the news as they made a most recent acquisition of VCA, uh, very important to us in the region, a, a veterinary uh, organization that we know well. And Howard is also a senior fellow uh, at the University of California, Davis, in the Department of Plant Sciences. He's a science advisor at the MIT Media Lab. And most importantly, as you hear Howard and, and read about his bio, uh, he's had a very strong career in looking at under-resourced regions in the agricultural science and technology. And as such, he's a distinguished fellow at the World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi, Kenya. So Howard, come on up. And uh, while he's doing that, I'll uh, start to introduce our second panelist. So Howard, uh, before I do that, Howard is really going to represent the biological innovations uh, he's, you know, through his background, as you read, he's a geneticist, been largely involved with uh, lots of aspects of Mars science and technology, but uh, really had an impact worldwide in terms of trait genetics and what it means both for resourced and under-resourced regions. So we have, uh, I couldn't think of a more outstanding panelist to sort of think about and represent the biological innovations that could affect ag in the future. What are those implications? The second panelist is Dana Johnson Downing. Dana Johnson Downing uh, comes to us. Uh, she'll talk to us about her company, Trace Gains. And Dana Johnson Downing is the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Trace Gains. It's a software system she'll be describing. What da Dana uh, really brings to the table, she's had a long record in public service, uh, and she's also been a service member in the US Army Reserve. Uh, and and uh, what she brings to the panel is really a look at the information sciences and technology. As you hear about trace gains and what they do, uh, it'll open our minds to the innovations that we all see around big data, around information systems and information technology and traceability and what that means for ag. So Dana, come on up. Oh, there you are. So now we've had sort of we had the bio and the info uh, sort of vectors, and our last speaker panelist represents sort of the physical sciences and the sensor areas. Uh, we've seen an explosion of sensors and and what they can do uh, in terms of the device power. All of us walking around uh, with a, a very strong data collection, aggregation, and analytical device in our pockets now. And our third panelist is Eyal Garricht who is the president and chief technology officer of a company called Terabat. And Terabat uh, is a sensor platform that you'll be hearing a little bit about as uh, Eyal introduces the company. But I think we all, again, appreciate uh, the amount of sensor data that is available to us now, whether it's weather data, whether it's data sensors that are collecting more information about our environment, our climate, about the supply chain. And so Eyal will really represent the physical sector and the sensor innovations that we will uh, talk about in relation to the ag sector. So Eyal, come on up. 
Um, what we've decided to do, and I'll take a seat here in a moment, is uh, I'll let the speakers take about five minutes each to talk about uh, innovation. So what, what, are the, what are they innovating against? What are the problems that they uh, see that innovation in their focus is being applied to? And, and then I'll ask them uh, to comment each in their opening remarks a little bit about how that fits into the trends that they see in their, in their sectors. Now, True Mars is a large multinational company with lots of sectors of business, and, but yet I think uh, Howard can talk about this in the context of the things like biological innovations we see like CRISPR-Cas and things like that. And, and each of the speakers will take on that sort of question of what is the problem they're trying to innovate against and how do they see their technologies uh, trending in that way. So let me have a seat and we'll get started and uh, we'll have some conversation up front here and uh, invite, as uh, you heard the organizers, uh, your questions, your comments. And so I encourage you to be thinking about those. There's cards at your table. You can give those to people to bring them up to us. And we'll turn to the audience and see what your questions are. We want this to be a conversation, as you've heard. And the people we brought up here on stage, I think, can stimulate that conversation. And we'll continue to try to do so. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'll sit down uh, here. And uh, maybe I'll start with Howard. Um, you know, Howard, uh, biotechnology and the biosciences uh, really are moving at a fast pace. And I think on everyone's mind uh, most recently, of course, is gene editing uh, and gene editing tools, which continued to advance. In fact, trait development has been a big part of, of what we've seen in innovation in the ag sector. As you heard Dean Menon talk about agricultural sector and, and sort of the advances that have been made. Um, Jim Clapper recently called CRISPR-Cas9 a weapon of mass destruction in the Senate in 2016. And so there's been a huge interest in what kinds of tools uh, are available or developing and how, how are they safe. I bring that out as an example, but maybe Howard, you'd like to talk a little bit about how you see the innovations uh, at Mars. What are the issues that you're uh, focused on and how biosciences and biotechnology is playing a role in that? Sure, if we could just pull up this one slide. I just wanted to show this one little quick slide for a few moments. Uh, part of supply chains have to do with new ways of working, which is part of our topic. And uh, the only way this works is uncommon collaborations. The collaborations that used to be the standard bearers of activity around the world no longer have meaning in the same way. You can't really depend on the government. You can't depend on foundations. You can't depend on the sort of the methodology of the National Science Foundation continuously funding you. So we formed a little group called the African Orphan Crops Consortium. You can see from the slide, it's a pretty wide-ranging group of people. The express purpose, different from the word that uh, Secretary Vilsack used, I would prefer if he used the word nutrition instead of food. Because hollow calories, which are what many people eat every day, are a real problem. So we're looking to improve 101 food crops simultaneously in Africa using the most advanced biological technologies, the most advanced sequencers, the most advanced ma uh, utilization of that information, all in the public domain. And it's, it's sponsored by the NEPAD, which is the African Union's development arm. And when we started it, there was a question about, you know, how much technology can we use? Can we use marker-assisted selections? What will the Europeans say? Will they shut us out of their markets because they have certain views about technology which are not shared in other parts of the world? So I put this slide up just to say that the way we have thought about supply chains, the way we thought about collaborations, really needs to not have a theory of change, but a change of theory. Because the way we've been operating no longer has a really a, an effect in the way it should have in the world. So only 37% of the rural population of Africa suffers chronic hunger and malnutrition. So that causes stunting, which means you'll never neurologically, physically, or economically develop 100%. 48% of India in the rural sector suffers stunting. And shockingly, 7% of the United States suffers stunting. It's all can be fixed through nutrition. 
But it's not nutrition in a, in, a, in a little package. It has to be grown and you have to have it available and it has to make the rural sector vibrant again. At the same time, 4.5 billion people suffer aflatoxin poison every day. Aflatoxin is a mycotoxin. Some of you may know about it. You hear about it in peanuts every now and then. But in a bad year in the United States, fumonisin, which is a mycotoxin, causes $1.6 billion worth of losses to the U.S. maize industry. So these are huge numbers. And when 4.6 billion people eat aflatoxin every day and poison themselves, you wake up in the morning and say, I gotta do something about it. And the, and the only way to really do anything about it, since there's no natural resistance, though some has been shown possibly in maize, is to think outside the box of a supply chain. And today that means, how would you put a puzzle together that could be solved by a large group of people? So on October 16th, we'll put a series of puzzles up on a website called Foldit that has 500,000 players, almost none of them biologists, but they're players. They don't know you can't fold proteins the way that we think you can only fold them. So these people will play this game, all of it will be evaluated, and just to give you an idea how serious Fold it is, um, Nature ran a paper published by, or presented by Fold it that had 57,000 authors. 57,000 people solved the problem. So we've been working for 30 years to try to solve something like aflatoxin, first with Afligard, competitive soil micro, uh, mycorrhizae and microorganisms. That failed almost completely. We've tried it other ways, but so now we have to fix the plant and we have to fix storage. So our notion for folding the protein into an enzyme that will attract the aflatoxin and then neutralize it is one way. The other way is using CRISPR-Cas9. And when we talk about CRISPR-Cas9, people are talking about it as a model from about seven or eight years ago. Because it's not CRISPR-Cas9 version one anymore, it's version eight, nine, or 10 that are going on simultaneously. And we work with experts. Coming from private industry, we have that opportunity. So our CRISPR work is done with Jennifer Dowd, one of the two uh, discoverers of this technology. So we're working on peanuts because many of you probably like peanut M&Ms and we have trouble with aflatoxin. Some of you uh, eat maize, and maize is a really big problem in many parts of the world. 70% of the maize we use in products in India is rejected, but it doesn't go to the incinerator, it goes into the food chain in a different place. So by doing good for ourselves, we do bad for society. So we're forced to act differently than corporations did 25 or 30 years ago, and to look at cutting edge technologies with no regard, no regard, at this point, for what happens if an activist group stands up and says it's not allowed? It's usually from lack of information like gene editing. This is not the same as genetically engineering. It's a very interesting technology. It'll work in humans as it's done in a couple terrible disease situations in the United States and in Europe. It's gonna work in animals and it's gonna work in plants where I live. And so we think these technologies offer opportunities that never ever were offered to us before. And it's the responsibility of, of society and corporations and uncommon collaborations to take these technologies and apply them for the benefit of society. Thanks, Howard. And he, he brought up two important concepts there. One we'll come back to on democratization of science uh, and the other one about collaborations. We'll come back to those. Uh, Dana, I'd like to turn to you because Fold It's a great example of uh, lots of data coming in from lots of different places, uh, some of it unverified, some of it you don't know if I should include it. Do they become one of the 57,000 authors or not? Uh, your, your company, and maybe you could talk a little bit about trace gains, but you know, you're really in the traceability. How do you verify information? What do you do with that information? Whether it's in biology or other areas, this is really important, but you could talk a little bit about trace gains and, and sort of the information technology position it's holding with regard to information. Sure. <clears throat> trace gains um, is software. We're a company just down the road in Westminster. And we like to say that we're revolutionizing 
information exchange across the supply chain. And what do we mean by that? What kind of information? Um, our customers are food manufacturers, uh, brokers, distributors, um, in that middle part of the food supply chain. So you've got the first mile of agriculture and the last mile of the food supply chain is retail and the consumer. So we're that middle part that's um, working to ensure food safety, quality, and that your business relationships in that middle part of the food supply chain um, are verified. So our software goes out and collects GFSI certifications, um, insurance documents, you know, on and on and on. And we're trying to in, um, interject some standardization to this process. You would be surprised at how antiquated some food manufacturers are when it comes to um, both their internal processes, but in terms of the way that they manage data and documents, um, we often are a solution that comes in behind and replaces three ring binders and um, spreadsheets. Uh, so what we've sought to do is to take technology um, and go in and gather that documentation so we auto automate the gathering of that information, take that off of the quality person's job so that they can get back to the job they were hired to do. Um, and, we, and then we're able to analyze that data, offer visualization tools so that someone in R&D or quality or food safety can see which of their suppliers are in compliance, which are out, how can they, if they find something that has been shipped in a lot that's not in compliance, can they negotiate a discount, do they have to reject that lot? It's an information management tool that they can have to do their jobs better. And then ultimately, we have a safer food supply. Um, one of the things that we do is uh, specification publishing. So one of the largest food manufacturers in the world uses our system to publish their specifications. And then their suppliers have to say, yeah, yeah we can meet this, or can we make this change? Um, and what that does is it puts everyone um, you know, one source of the truth for what's going to be in specification, what's not going to. So what we like to think is that um, information exchange, it, it's not a company, it's not one software company. We're trying to build an ecosystem and a platform. Um, and I think one of the largest challenges in this kind of environment is we're not the only ones that do this. We happen to think we're really good. We're probably the best at it. Um, a as we move forward, how do we have these disparate systems talking to each other? Um, you know, because ultimately, it is about food safety, but it's about creating higher standards and raising the bar. Uh, for trace gains, um, the Food Safety Modernization Act, I'm sure many of you have been dealing with this new regulatory environment that we find ourselves in, um, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to raise the bar on food safety. Um, and unfortunately, there's a hunger for information out there about it within food manufacturing, R&D people, um, from, the, from farmers themselves, all the way through the supply chain, foreign suppliers. People don't know what their responsibility is yet. And it's one of the mantles that we've taken up to almost offer sort of our own extension service, for lack of a better word. TraceGain spends a lot of our time and resources on developing tools and holding educational seminars, um, using distance learning technology like webinars um, to sort of uh, educate the industry on what their responsibilities are and how technology can be a part of that solution. Great, thanks. And you know, what's behind all that data, of course, is the ability to take measurement. Uh, and, and you know, a lot of the electronic records that Trace Gaines is working on depend on, uh, you know, the, the feeds, as she, as she said, the data verification of what goes into the, to the, to the supply chain with regard to the information system. Behind that, of course, is a lot of sensor measurement. And, you know, I think what uh, you heard uh, Dean Menon talk about in an innovation, you know, in some cases we're re-aggregating, doing things a new way as a way of innovating, and I think Trace Gaines is a great example of that. Um, our last panelist is from Terabat, and Eyal, uh, you know, it's interesting, we, we also recognize, I think, in the ag sector, when we heard about CRISPR, for example, there, there's a lot of cross-fertilization of technology, especially as the cost of that technology drops and the ag sector can adopt it. Um, and they borrow from other sectors. And so it's interesting, uh, Terabat uh, got its start with funding from NASA and DARPA and NIST because it's a physical-based sensor measurement you'll hear in a, minute, in a minute. But I think it's a great example of how we're borrowing 
uh, platforms, uh, whether it's from you know, information systems, physical systems, biological systems, and we're seeing them uh, cross-fertilize into the ag innovation sector. So maybe, Al, you could tell us a little bit about Terabat. Thank you very much. So I, I guess my contribution here is going to be not giving you the bird eye view, but maybe the tranches, what we as a small company trying to get into very large uh, sector like ag and try to implement or, or establish um, a revenue based source to fund us so we can continue doing great things in ag, which is a very large opportunity, and of course in other sectors. So what do we do? We developed a platform that can detect pathogens based on the VOCs. VOCs are volatile organic compounds. Most of us who can smell or who can interact with other kind of systems do that via those VOCs that are airborne and, and essentially get to us. So if we can do that, and, and many of you heard all of these examples about dogs and other kind of animals that can sense those things naturally, but uh, obviously we would like to make it a little bit more clinically and, and precisely and, and in a platform that we can plug in and get to work on a, on a routine basis with the same precision. So that's what we do. We develop that, but we did not develop that for ag. We developed that for astrophysical application. And it takes a lot of money and many years sitting in a laboratory trying to develop those sensors, and most of the time they don't work. Uh, any scientist who tell you, I tried something and it worked the first time, uh, is probably not telling you the truth or is very lucky uh, uh, scientist. So it takes years and years to develop those uh, technologies. And then the next problem that sometimes seems to be even as big as the first problem is how do you package them so you can put them in a certain commercial environment and let all these huge databases be collected. So we as a small company have to deal with all of those aspects of the development of new technology into the field. And, and you can imagine why ag is very attractive to us. Uh, we can play in the healthcare, we can play in other kind of sectors. Healthcare has its own barriers, the FDA to a certain level, physicians that are very uh, resisting new technologies. But in the ag, where the problems are fairly big, if you, the margin is small, but the problems, cost-wise, are very, very big. If you take a small portion of that and you apply solution like ours, like others, you can basically change the way the business is done. And that's good from a safety point of view, and that's good from a financial, from a business point of view. So, so I'll try to give you the opportunities and the challenges that a company such as ours facing with this new technology. Great, thanks to y'all. So um, I should have mentioned, and we, you know, we have perspectives here from a large multinational corporation. Trace Gains is about a 10-year-old company. Uh, Terabat's a re relatively newer company, a startup company. So also, I forgot to mention, we have perspectives on innovation that uh, really sort of, uh, I think, span a perspective across industry. And uh, I want to ask a question to sort of start a little bit more of a conversation on the democratization of innovation. Because uh, we're in a world, I mean, CRISPR-Cas right now, you heard about the search and replace function. It's essentially a search and replace function for genomes. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's now being done in high school science fairs. You can order these kits online. You can essentially uh, do biotechnology that I couldn't even envision when I was in graduate school. Uh, and so we've seen a democratization of, of, of a tool like that. We've seen democratization of the information sciences where the data availability to all of us in our pocket connected to those sensors is now widely available and sometimes quite uh, readily shared, as you heard Howard talk about, and even the intentional democratization of information coming out of something like the African Orphan Crops Consortium. I'd like to hear you talk about that and what it means with regard to how you innovate, how you think about innovation in terms of this democratization. It has so many different angles of, you know, cost, as you point out, it, it lowered the cost, accessibility. But how do you either try to take advantage of that and harness it? Or how do you try to defend against it in some cases where it could create some threats? I want to, want to start out, Howard? When we think about democratization of science and technology, Alan's absolutely correct. Amazon sells CRISPR-Cas9 kits. 
You can order any one of six. I wouldn't tell you how good they are. I wouldn't advise you to use it on yourself if you're trying to cure a, a complex disease. <laughs> how, however, what happens is when it gets down to the school fair at a high school, the fear is ameliorated from the science very quickly because a kid comes home and talks to his parents that, you know, I'm using CRISPR-Cas9 and they explain it. In the late 70s and 80s, there were some technologies that were so tightly held by corporations that they became an anathema. And the word GMO is associated with that. Gene editing doesn't fit in that category, so it's really quite extraordinary. The same with sequencing technology. When even, I'm even older than Alan, if you can imagine that possible. But when we were in school, it was Sanger sequencing, and that was half the size of a school bus. Now Oxford Nanopore is very close to a breakthrough, and they plug into your computer through the USB port and can do phenomenal sequencing. And Illumina technology with their high-seq methodologies will have a $1,000 genome this year and a $100 genome in three or four years. So the fact is we have all this in front of us. It doesn't mean anything if we don't know how to use it. And if we don't use it to solve, I think, societal problems. And this is where a company like Mars is privately held can say, we think we need to solve the aflatoxin problem. We think we need to solve the stunting problem as a major force in the activity and to build different types of collaboration. So for us, this use of technology is phenomenal. No one has ever sequenced a factory. I mean, taken all of the swabs and gone through a factory because all of a sudden you find out there's five or six different types of salmonella in your factory. You know, everyone thought it was one type and everyone treated it a certain way. So we're working with IBM and a consortium of other companies to learn how to sequence a factory so we can prevent the very things that uh, you don't want to have in your products. You, you, and you, you also need to know how to fix them. And this is where the technology comes in. When we think about democratization, there's one website called Cyverse that holds data that's very interesting in the public domain. Turns out this little company called Google has started something called Google Genomics, which will supplant that very quickly because its capability is much higher. It will also be very, very public. The thing that we have to worry about is some of these technologies getting buried and inaccessible with the exception of a few groups. And that's what I worry about, and that's when these breakthroughs happen, that we have to push them into the public very, very quickly so everyone has access to them. And you know, the other thing it does, it sort of levels the playing field. Secretary Vilsack talked about the rural economy. Well, you know, it doesn't matter if you're sitting in, in rural America, you can order your CRISPR casts. Uh, you know, system or you can uh, plug into an information or a sensor system that might inform you about the world around you. And Dana, you talked about, you know, information uh, aggregation and verification. Um, in the democratized world of, of you know, innovative uh, people and science, how do you deal with uh, the democratization of information and, and how do you bring that into the verification framework that you're developing? It's not always easy. Um... You know, in the supply chain, there's a lot of competitors that are sharing suppliers, sharing customers, and there's a, you know, probably to a certain extent, a, a widespread condition of um, paranoia. And um, we have this ongoing call for more transparency. It's, consumers are clamoring for more information. They want to know down to the exact field that their, you know, cereal bar came from. Um, and then as you go up through the supply chain, those information requests um, get more and more complicated. Um, you know, and then you end up with the farmer who, who grew the cereal um, who wants to cock a shotgun and say, you want a third party audit me? You know, get off my property. And so it's very, it's very complicated when we try to, as a supply chain, try to solve these larger problems and say, okay, Transparency, everybody wants it, nobody wants to give it. Can we identify those things that should be shared, what should be protected, and what platforms are we gonna use to share that kind of information? 
And that's where we see a role for our company, a thought leadership role for our company. But it's going to take a lot of different kinds of people from different companies, different expertise to come to the table in a way where we can say, we don't have to share IP, but let's come to the intersection of these problems. And maybe we develop something that's new and, and we all share in the IP of that afterwards, but you know, can we, can we you know, put the paranoia on the shelf for a long enough to have some meaningful conversations on data democratization and innovation? Great. Yep. Yeah, it said that sensors don't lie, but uh, in the context of you know, collecting sensor information from multiple sources, there's that issue of you know, how interoperable is it and uh, how do you deal with that democratization of sensor data? Even though you're sort of looking at one volatile aspect, clearly the prediction of diagnosis and disease is going to take in multiple factors of data and uh, a lot of that could be coming from different sources. Yes. Well, uh, let me try and answer that first and then I have a couple of things okay. to say in response to what I just heard. Um, yes, the way that you deal with sensors, the way that we deal with engineering or physical problems is usually trying to isolate them as much as we can. So, for example, if we know we're looking for one pathogen, we are trying to isolate that, make sure the ecosystem around that is so small and primitive so we know all the information related only to this mechanism, to this system. And then we're starting to, to build it up, to make it more and more complex. And sometimes successfully, sometimes not that successfully, then we back off and try that again, and it goes and goes and goes. So, and that's a scientific approach. I think many different disciplines behave exactly in the same way. Let me, let me touch this point because I think, as I said at the beginning, we are at a completely different level as this small company, Google. It, did I pronounce it correctly? Google? Okay. And, and Mars. They have the pockets. They have all the money in the world. Or it seems like that when you're small trying to survive. And they can play this role right now. I can assure you Google in the beginning did not behave like that because they did not, they were trying to survive, they were trying to build their, their infrastructure, to build uh, cash, nice cash flow. And the pressure on them doing the good things is very different than to a small company like ours doing the good things. And it doesn't mean that we don't do them. I mean, people over here, some faculty here in the, in the audience know that we are trying to collaborate. We are trying to share additional development of IP with other people in the field. But the IP that we have created, this is essentially an oxygen line that will potentially remove some competition and will allow us to grow. So, so when you're small and IP is all you got, you look at that very, very differently, and that's reality. And it doesn't mean what our uh, good intention when we are big later on. So Yal brings up, uh, re brings up the point he was making earlier about the uh, innovation cycle and the capital required to see adoption. And I think this is uh, another topic uh, other panels in the, in the summit are going to pick up in, in greater uh, context. We've got a great panel of venture capital and things like that, but it's great to perhaps bring it in here because of the perspectives of a startup and a multinational company. So, to your point, uh, you know, I spent a part of my career in biotech startups and in the pharma industry or the pharma sector, they roll about 25% of their profits back in R&D. In ag, it's about an order of magnitude less. Uh, and so uh, my observation, although we've seen the crossover uh, fertilization technologies, is that it's harder for ag because of the margins in the, in the products to adopt technology early and invest in, in the traditional way we've seen at least biotech do it, not necessarily endorsing that that's the only way to do it. But it does appear that there are challenges, as you've pointed out, that are unique to the ag sector and the ag economics that are at play in the innovation cycle. And I know Mars started a venture capital company uh, when they were at the first uh, Ag Innovation Summit here two years ago. Mars Ventures came now, it's called Digitalis, but they started a venture arm to try to, I think, isolate this kind of activity. But I'm kind of curious uh, what your perspectives on that are, Eyal, because you're pointing out that the capital required for taking a startup technology like yours to the market is significant. And yet the ag sector struggles with where can it adopt it with regard to its maturity, robustness. But most of all, it seems as though it's the economics that are, are challenging from the ag sector because they can't recover 
the cost of investing in that technology over its development life cycle. Do you want to comment more about yeah. that and then we'll, we'll go down the line yeah. and hear the other perspectives? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for this point because I think, although I said I'm not looking at the bird eye view, we are in the trenches, we spend a huge amount of time thinking from the 30,000 uh, uh, feet above there, what do we need to do in order to penetrate this industry? For us, every small hill looks like this humongous mountain, and we need to understand how to go there. So there, there is a lot of things that we need to learn how to take what we have, uh, the cost that we already spend, and translate that. Um, there, there's a lot of examples, and we had this discussion before, comparing that to other industries. So the basis of our cell phone was developed by essentially NASA and NSF money developing those tiny detectors that uh, people used on telescopes in the 60s and 70s. And then we had a revolution. So every one of us has a smartphone that has more power in it than the Apollo space station. And why did that happen? Was that because the basic research was developed by the government? So the answer is yes. There was a lot of that happening there. Today there is a, a, a lot less resources for development of basic research. I, I spend my graduate school developing devices paid by NASA. NASA will never pay for those development anymore. So what's happening today when the industry, communication industry, um, uh, you know, other kind of industry in electronics want to do something right now? They take the technology that it's already in the public domain, relatively in the public domain, uh, funded by federal sources, and then they put their own money to get it to the next level. So now you're asking, how is AG that working on a very small margin can do that? I, I think the economics here is slightly different. Our technology, for example, can be applied to food pathogens in food safety. So when you look at the number, and we did a lot of uh, searching for those numbers, they're not very consistent, but at least one number that we heard over and over again, and we pretty much believe right now, is that in the US alone, every single year, there is $21 billion lost due to recalls based on food pathogens. $21 billion. Now, when you add to that the indirect cost, and the indirect cost is lost of, of equity, uh, uh, lower productivity, and many, many other aspects, the number is more than $80 billion. Those are astronomical numbers. Those are more than many fields in healthcare combined. So the question is, what a big company that can afford maybe investing in new solution should look in terms of the calculation? It cost us potentially $20 million in, in food loss every single year for good recall, I mean justified recall and unjustified recalls. If we invest 10% of that into looking into the new technology, maybe that's a good investment. It's not what's gonna be the cost to do those additional tests that should really concern those companies, in my view. It's what, it's like insurance company. We all have insurance, so we pay when we are stuck, we, we can get some money back. And I think that's how people, it's, especially in the ag, the big firms, not the small one, they cannot afford doing that right now, but the big one should start thinking. And I hope that they're gonna follow the communication, space technology, by the way, NASA is not making the biggest you know, revolution and advances right now. It's SpaceX and all of the other Bezos company, they make a lot of innovation right now, so much faster. And every once in a while, the missiles just, you know, explodes without uh, going into the sky. But that's okay, there is cost in doing any innovation. Well, we have a big company on the stage, so maybe we can ask Howard uh, how, how Mars views this in the context of capital investments and innovation and maybe bringing out the Mars venture story. Yeah, I think there's two things. One is that collectively the funding world, whether it's foundations or governments, or private individual venture cap, has forgot the notion of impact acceleration. So we, we don't think about impact acceleration. And there's a, I know there's a group of people on the West Coast being formed around Silicon Valley that wants to be able to have impact. So things like Yal's company would fit into a category like that where they see this is impact. And to give you an idea, we have a person who's in charge of quality and food safety. I don't think this person ever sleeps. 
because they worry 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that something's going to happen that might harm a human being or harm a companion animal. And so the amount of effort that goes into quality and food safety in a company like Mars or our competitors is beyond your imagination, really. And we built the largest quality and food safety center in the world in China because that's where the biggest problem is. And it's now approved by the Chinese government. We're training people. But this whole notion of quality and food safety is, is so heroic. I, I can't possibly um, encourage you to believe how big it is unless you're in the industry. It is the major consideration every day. Add in fisheries, add in dairy, add in animal byproducts, add in animal meat production, add in all of that. And sensor technology is the only way to do it because the way it was done in the past, you kind of observe something, then you induced a theory by it's clean or it's not. That won't work anymore. You know, it's got to be handheld devices that you can walk around and really make these decisions. So Mars formed a company called Digitalis. It's interesting, Digitalis is a poison plant, but <laughs> so much for the people who make calls on names of companies. And one of the things is that they're trying to be impact accelerators. We don't want to own it. We want to help accelerate something to go from discovery to translation to scale. So everyone in this room who is in agriculture loves to make discovery. Or if you're in ag technology, or if you're in any kind of technology, we all love discovery. We all hate translation because it's proof of proposition and it takes a long time. And then comes this notion of scaling, which Eyal is talking about. How do you get it out to scale? So in a company like our size, if we find a company that we believe we should invest in because they have the right mentality, they have the right discoveries, and it can scale to help us, then we're very interested in that. And as you can imagine, since we're both interested in humans and animals, that the breadth of our consideration is quite large. Dana, I imagine in your company's history, you were essentially, as we said before, innovating around a system that existed, but needed to be innovated around to make it uh, more digital. H how did you uh, encounter your challenges in raising capital around your innovations? Like Alan said, um, Trace Gains has been around for about nine years. Um, its predecessor company was much more in the uh, animal agricultural world. It was a company called Ag Info Link. And they were doing, you know, traceability using uh, ear tags on cattle, and they identified a need in food manufacturing that um, they thought they could solve with with our supplier compliance product, and so they reinvented the company to solve a different problem. And so I think maybe that's one of the messages today is that you know always be innovating, and the the old solution isn't always the main solution should, you should be focusing on today. So um, I also think it's important to, to understand the difference between innovation and technology versus in agriculture. They're very different um, paths to success. Um, in, in the tech world, we focus on MVPs, and I'm not talking about sports. I'm talking about minimally viable products. And in the ag world, you guys are out there doing years and years of field trials and, you know, it has to work before you can release it into the wild. And that's not the world that we, that we live in in the tech world. So it's not a one, you know, innovation is not a one size fits all um, problem or solution. And I, I think we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, great. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. So be thinking about your questions. I've got a few here to get us started. But if you have a question uh, you'd like uh, to ask, we'll, uh, we'll be happy to take it in the time we have left. So I'm going to start out with a question uh, that came to us about regulation. And um, you know we're sort of in an interesting time in this country around regulation. Uh, and uh, I think it has uh, real impacts for ag. And I wondered, uh, we've got sort of great thinkers in different sectors here or different vectors around bioinfo and physical. So what is the impact of potentially reduced agricultural regulation on trade? And I think there's an interest in looking at that from an international perspective. 
Um, I don't know, maybe Dana, you'd like to start in terms of, uh, I know you mentioned the Food Safety Modernization Act. I think that's clearly one of the uh, U.S. regulatory movements that we've seen, and there was just a more recent announcement about FSMA. So why don't you talk a little bit about regulation? Sure. Um, I've worked in the regulatory world, um, but before the Food Safety Modernization Act was the most important thing to me, I worked for USDA, and I helped open up new markets for U.S. agriculture. I was at the embassy in Moscow for three years, and I know a few things about non-scientific trade barriers. Um, so, you know, to touch on what what you mentioned about um, about global trade, um, I think, you know, I think certainly technology can help us get on the same page with our trading partners and share information and um, build. You know, a lot of what USDA does overseas is not just ensure that we maintain markets that are mature markets like China, um, but they go out and <laughs> they spend a lot of time doing capacity building, teaching, you know, basic concepts, extension type projects. Um, so, I, you know, when it comes to the, you know, regulatory environment around trade right now, um, I think ultimately the business has to win out in that argument of free versus fair trade. You know, I have to believe in a system where our number one and our number two trading partners and our next door neighbors, I have to believe that the business world um, isn't going to let short-sighted um, concerns about trade deficit and, you know, the business world understands what's, what are the drivers and influencers of trade deficits. Um, so I think this might be a case where we have to just set aside the political discussion and focus on the economic drivers here. And, and I maintain hope that um, that, that sanity and, and economics will will win the day on that issue. Um, when it when it comes to um, regulatory, uh, the either whether we're talking about GMO labeling or Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, I think we're seeing increasing amounts of regulation and and. And of course, and it's not been it's been pretty good for our business, to be honest with you. Helping companies understand how to meet their regulatory compliance commitments is kind of what we do. Um, and then when it comes to GMO labeling, uh, which I think USDA is trying to figure out how to implement those rules, um, or, or, um, I think you know that information sharing and getting on the same page is is really important. Um, I think. And, and technology, you know, not just knowing what the rules are, but how do we get systems? So we're partnering with a food labeling software company um, to help uh, take the data out of our system and put it into food labeling systems so that when we have new changes, whether it's nutritional labeling, GMO labeling, that, um, that industry can react more quickly. Uh, you know, we had this delay this year in the food regulatory, uh, the food labeling deadline, it was supposed to be this year, and now we don't know. A lot of our customers spent millions and millions and millions of dollars getting ready for this year's deadline. And that's kind of a new, uh, an early adopter tax to pay that money and then maybe have the rules change sometime over the next year and the, the goalpost gets moved. Um, so I think the more that we can make those changes more efficient for industry, make it easier to pull data out of one system and put it into another, um, I, I think you know, that's what technology and that's what innovation can do for industry. And Howard, uh, you're sourcing cacao mostly from Cote d'Ivoire right now, so, uh, and, and I imagine uh, have product lines that pull from all over the world. What, what are you seeing in terms of regulation that might be in fact impacting uh, Mars businesses? Well, Cote d'Ivoire is the world's largest producer of cacao. Ghana is number two, Indonesia is number three, Ecuador is probably number four. Uh, so we buy from around the world. Uh, we, we don't necessarily buy direct. We buy through brokers, the Cargills and the Dreyfuses and the very Calabos, Olam, Ecoms, what have you. In, in our particular case, if I look at Cote d'Ivoire, in 1960, the forest cover was worth $150 billion. In 2015, when the FAO stat was published, there was 94% of the forest cover was gone, and the entire value of cacao sold to that point from 1960 to 2015 was $100 billion. So they lost $50 billion worth of value. 
So one would say that the issue that we face now is inequality in supply chains. You know, how do we pay for carbon in the trees? How do we pay for carbon in the soil? How do we increase the yield to the smallholder? And if Ed Phelps, who won a Nobel Prize for his theory of supply chains, is right, early adapters will win and late adapters will lose. And it's just an unfortunate truth, especially in the third world. So you have to work on ge genetics, you have to work on the supply chain, you have to work on all these things. And regulatory, I think we actually have a higher level of sense of what that should be than maybe even some of the countries. I'm not talking about Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, but other places where devastation is caused by supply chains, whether it's oil palm or soybeans. Uh, there's been a general disregard. And if we consider ourselves to be a literate culture and we have environmental, conservation, ecological, social, cultural, and economic issues at our heart, then all those things have to be in play with that. And I think corporations like Mars do exist in that world and are thinking differently than they may have thought 20 years ago. Yeah, I'll imagine the regulatory world, in, in, in your case, you know, oftentimes compliance is set by what sensors can measure, right? Mm -hmm. If we set the lowest limit of acceptability on the limit of detection of our sensor technology, I wonder if you could comment on that in the context of regulation and how, how it is impacted by sensor development, but in the same context of this sort of regulatory environment we're in. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very good question that we deal with all the time. As a matter of fact, sometimes when, when I go to conferences and, and I hear all kind of uh, scientific theoretical talk, and I know in, in the lab we cannot recreate that, and some of the rules and regulation requires a certain detection level of a pathogen, something that there is no technology uh, demonstrated capability as of now. So how do you really do that? Uh, so so the, the problem is, is how do we even come with a regulatory uh, uh, um, criteria? Are we involving the, the people that understand technology? But it's not only technology, because if I can make one measurement in a laboratory and I can get to a certain type of sensitivity, can I do that in reproducible way in the middle of a rural area where I have to do that 10 times an hour and it's in a very dirty environment? So, so converting regulatory to reality in the field is, is, is another aspect that I think most of the people that um, sometimes involve in those regulatory are not very... Uh, aware of. Um, we talk in our company with many people, leaders of food manufacturers, especially in the Boulder area. Boulder is becoming kind of the organic center of the USA. All of the bars, the L bars, the drink, LT drinks, they're all trying to have a Boulder address. And the big ones, the one that you probably heard in the news all the time, they aware of FISMA. They know that there may be 80% uh, within the, the, the rules that FISMA is set up, maybe 90%, but most of them will tell you we're not there yet. The small manufacturer, the small producer will tell you, we cannot even worry about that. We don't have the resources. As a matter of fact, if we stay in business in the next two years, <laughs> then we'll worry about that. So, so there is a very disconnect between regulatory, that it's for the big company, the one that do have the pockets to create those mechanisms, even if they have the science and the technology to, to, to check that on a regular basis, to the one, and those small ones are becoming much bigger aspect of the economy, the small producer of health food and bars and, and, and the rest of them. So what do we do for all of those different companies? I think it's not well understood, at least not by all the discussion we had with the companies. Great. Uh, the next question uh, came in, and I'll pose it to all three of our panelists. And it, I think it's a great opportunity to sort of hear how these three sort of areas, info, bio, and, and physical, are thinking about what ultimately drives much of our motivation and intent in the ag sector. That's producing more food and more nutritious food. I think that's uh, one of the, the themes that we uh, certainly are interested in. And um, so the question really comes from the audience is what kind of untapped resources exist that will allow us to do that without putting a strain on existing resources? And I think what comes to mind and an opportunity to chat about, and even Secretary Vilsack mentioned, 
you know, that we really can't talk about food and ag without talking about water or energy. That these, and I think especially sitting inside of a land grant university, uh, you get a, a, a sense of sort of the resource utilization, optimization, and management that is required to achieve those goals. So I'd love to hear your perspectives on what ultimately drives us is really to feed the future, right? And to feed it in a nutritious way. And uh, how can we do that uh, from your perspectives without putting more strain on the system? I think that's the question. And it'd be great to sort of consider that food, energy, water interplay. Who wants to start? Uh, what is certainly clear is that the large seed companies Biotech companies up to now have not made water use efficiency and nutrient use efficiency their goal. Neither have they figured out how to make nitrogen fixing maize or wheat or rice. These are the holy grails. But there hasn't been any incentive to work on nutrient use or water use efficiency in the way that there should be, especially in a place like California where we know we're going to have another series of droughts and water is critical, but even in Colorado the same thing happens. So when there's no incentive because the largest companies that control those areas of discourse won't do anything, then the only hope is that the government will step in. You know, NIFA should really focus on nutrient use efficiency and water use efficiency. And what it really means as you talk about a trickle-down system is when it gets to the third world where they suffer the most from lack of good germplasm, lack of nutrient-enriched vegetable plant material, highly folated, high vitamin A, zinc, whatever you need to develop a, a, a completely and healthy pregnancy, you realize that it's just not happening. And recently I had an, a, a guest editorial in Handelsblatt, which is the German equivalent of the Wall Street Journal. It's a, a business magazine. And it, the whole topic was united against hunger. And that's one thing I don't think we are yet. Uh, Secretary Vilsack made a, a very interesting plea about that. But most people are, are not thinking about what's going on in the third world and the fact that we have stunting at the levels or aflatoxin at the levels that we have them because it seems so far away. In the luxuriant environment we live in, those things become very difficult to focus on. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah. yeah, but I think most of those things, when they come too close to home, everybody all of a sudden wakes up. So when we hear on the news that there is Ebola in Africa, okay, well, we cry for a second, but all of a sudden people start going on airplanes, arriving at DIA, then we worry about that. I think many of the issues you're talking about would be translated to economical incentives because the problem will come here so quickly and we cannot start working on them when we have a Cat 5 Oregon right now, nothing you do in Florida is gonna make any difference right now. We should have done that 10 years ago. Maybe now we had a solution. So this is like the building storm, and as soon as we're gonna have the front wave of that, people will start waking up, and maybe the money will follow. When, one thing to that point. We were talking about populations. Africa, the continent of Africa, will be the most populous continent in 2050. So either we fix the problems there, or more mass migration, or mass hunger, mass uh, chronic malnutrition. So the, there is a role for land grant institutions and private companies and, and young startups to actually put some focus into it, but it does cost money. And it, it, it takes away a little bit from the dairy industry here to work on the dairy industry there. So there needs to be a system by where an academic institution can allot some of its resources, not just to train the people from these countries, but to actually send the technologies there and make them adaptable in those places. And that's missing largely at almost every land-grant university. I think we have another question from the audience. <laughs> We've got a good stack of them, so I encourage you, if you ask some questions, go ahead and try and grab one of the panel members to ask those specific questions you had. But one good one that I think there's a lot of expertise on is, other than finished goods or tra other than finished goods traceability, what else can or should blockchain technology be used for? 
to stump her. Uh, blockchain is going to be everywhere in every aspect of our lives about a, a, at a multiplier faster than a cell phone was. And, you know, when blockchain really began, it was all about Bitcoin and the dark side of the economy. <laughs> and now it's becoming part of the uh, populist side of the economy. And it's highly trusted if you really understand it and look at how it actually works and how it's all verified and the history that goes with it. So I think it'll happen quickly. I, th I think places like Africa will adopt blockchain for micro loans, for, for one way to get money out to a rural sector where you might not otherwise be able to get it. So I'm very enthused by blockchain. Uh, I wish I'd have bought Bitcoin, a Bitcoin stock when it was beginning as opposed to now. <laughs> I would say, if you're not familiar with blockchain technology, um, follow Frank Yanis, the food safety guru at Walmart. He posts almost every day some interesting article about the use of blockchain, how they're using it. Um, and I, you know, we've had blockchain patents at our company from our predecessor company. Um, but I think you know, people like Frank who understand industry, who understand the food supply chain can see 20 years down the line that the rest of us are still kind of scratching our head trying to figure out what this technology is. Um, I, I would encourage you to uh, follow Frank. Great. Another question? All right, I'll keep going loud. Uh, probably time for just one more, uh, but I think this one was pretty interesting. Uh, what steps are being taken to compensate base level producers for their additional inputs that they have to stay compliant for food processors? Your simple answer, none. I mean, really, it just it doesn't work that way. That's what the inequality of supply chains is all about. Scale has a lot to do with the ability to uh, live within the rules and regulations. And smallholders, unless they're part of cooperatives which conglomerate the goods, have a much more difficult time to uh, succeed in that world. When I worked for the soybean industry, we had a way of saying, um, farmers are very economic creatures. If, if, uh, if, you wanna, you, if you want them to grow more identity preserved or more organic, just you know, add some incentive. Make a premium for that. There's no premium for food safety, unfortunately. Great. Well, I want to thank my panelists. It's been a great conversation. I encourage you to interact with them over the course of the summit and uh, appreciate your attention and uh, questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you.